There's no single system that works for every country. Uh, the tariffs were just exactly a veiled policy that was horrible for America. How do you think that we can fight this pandemic? What do you think that we should really work together? Good evening uh, and also good morning. Uh, this is uh, uh, Wang Huiyao, uh, the founder and the president of the Center for China and Globalization that uh, hosted this uh, dialogue from uh, CCC head office in Beijing. And uh, so we are really pleased to welcome all of you to tune in for this uh, CCG China and the World uh, special dialogue series. So this actually uh, special dialogue event was actually uh, at, as the background of the 50 years uh, anniversary of, uh, of, of course, Dr. Kissinger's visit to China, but also started the 50 years of uh, exchanges with China. What I'd like to, uh, to, to introduce uh, uh, the two very distinguished uh, uh, guests that to join us tonight is, uh, uh, first is, uh, is uh, Neil Bush. Uh, 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 Neil Bush is the founder and the chair of the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China relations. He's the third of the five children of President and Mrs. George H.W. Bush. So Mr. Bush has actually been involved with energy, real estate, and international business development for the four decades be beginning in 1980. Uh, but for the past 25 years, Mr. Bush has engaged in various international business development activities with a focus on China. Uh, but also I'd like to uh, introduce uh, another distinguished uh, guest tonight is uh, uh, David Firestam. He's the, actually the inaugural president and CEO of the George H.W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations, or you can call uh, a Bush China Foundation. And also a founding and a current member of the foundation board of directors. So, so I would like to start the dialogue uh, uh, tonight uh, with, uh, with, uh, you know, with Bush Foundation and also the, the senior representative of Bush Foundation. President George H.W. Bush was the pioneer in the U.S.-China diplomacy. He was the U.S. chief diplomatic envoy in China during the 1974-75, which was before U.S. and China formally established diplomatic ties. So, Neil, you, you, you first, uh, I remember you, you, you said somewhere, you first visited China in 1975, and of, of, of course, continued travel to China on a regular basis since then. So, given you have made to China and traveled to China 100 sometimes. Uh, so you have witnessed actually firsthand in the last, you know, four or five decades of the, of the, of the uh, tremendous changes that China has made. So, so maybe you can give your first uh, uh, assessment of uh, what you see the relationship. Yes, I was there in 1975. My, my three of my siblings and I visited for five weeks. We were in Beijing for four weeks and then traveled with my mother by train to Wuxi, Nanjing, and, and um, Shanghai. It has been a remarkable thing to sit on the sidelines and to witness this incredible growth uh, that China has experienced over the past 46 years when I was first there. The China I saw in 1975, and you know, I don't want to be offensive to anyone, but was basically freedomless. Everyone was equal, they were equally poor. Um, and that people were friendly to, up towards us. We rode our bikes all over the place and we were, we were treated very kindly, but there was propaganda machines everywhere. Everywhere you go, the, the word was being spouted out. People were still being sent to the end of the cultural revolution, being sent to the countryside. And, um, and people couldn't choose, make daily choices that clearly they can make today. And so looking back 40, six years later, it, it, if I were back in 1975, I, I couldn't have predicted or imagined that China would have had hundreds of millions of people lifted out of poverty, that the middle class would be growing as rapidly as it is, that the economy continues to, to, to churn out new jobs and, and crank out wealth for people, that people would enjoy daily freedoms that, that frankly, back then were clearly unimaginable, you know, happening in China. So, I, I've been deeply impressed by this, Henry. I'll, I'll be honest with you. And I think one of the things that separates me from other, other folks is the fact that I've been there and seen it grow over the many years. I've come to some deep conclusions. One, you know, not every 
there's no single system that works for every country, that every country needs to develop a system that is suitable and fitting for the conditions of that country. China's system has worked for China. If you look at the results over the many years, over the 46 years since I was there, over the 40 something years since formal ties have been established, the, the results speak for themselves. And so I, I, I'm, I'm a believer that, you know, our system works for us, their system, your system, the Chinese system works for China. We need to be respectful of, of, of that. And, and clearly Americans, you know, I've, been, I've been amazed, I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and just say that I've been amazed to be able to witness this, um, this change in China. And, you know, no one could have predicted it back 46 years ago. Thank you, Neil. Actually, uh, absolutely, you, you are the witness of this uh, great transformation that has been taking place uh, in China in the last uh, four or five decades. I mean, uh, you know, I'm sure that uh, uh, your father was uh, eight years as a vice president of uh, uh, Ronald Reagan and also served as the president of the United States. I'm sure he has done a lot of uh, uh, memorable work and uh, also what he was saying that uh, uh, the two, two, two great giants should work together. I mean, absolutely, uh, for the for the for the benefit of the mankind. So, so what, do you still remember some of the things you you've seen at the, the Beijing? Uh, uh, you know, you yeah. said you're four weeks there. I I remember your father was <laughs> named bicycle and that he ride a bike. Yeah. Name is the photo at the, at the Tiananmen Square. What about you? When you and your brother and sister came? Uh, no, five no years we had. We had the same experience. We rode bikes all over the place. It was really fun. We rode to Tiananmen Square. I, I distinctly remember pulling up to a stop sign, you know, where the guards were there with their hands up and stuff. And the, the crowd of bikes were stopped and gathered. And, and when, when the, those of us that were, you know, from America, the kind of white guys, long nose, they'd look yes. over and see us and they'd almost fall off their bikes. Yeah, we went to the zoo, Henry, to go see the pandas and other animals and you look behind us and there's a bigger crowd following us at the zoo than they, they were looking at the animals it was we were such a you know anyway but it was a friendly um you know adventure for us um one of the things i observed and this is something dad and i talked about during that trip was that if you if you um observed chinese consumers chinese individuals walking by like a like a bike shop or a, a, a shop that had like kitchen utensils or whatever, you could see in their eyes that they wanted more, that they wanted a better bike, a better flying pigeon or whatever bike. Um, and so it's, it was, I don't know, it was pretty clear that the, there were aspirations even then that had now led to this incredible, you know, growth and, and uh, realization of, of potential. But yeah, now I have vivid memories of it, and if uh, now I go back to China and cars everywhere, there's it, it's 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 like totally transformed. It's an amazing transformation, high speed rail, and you know internet connectivity everywhere. It's like a whole new world that couldn't have been imagined back in the bi bicycle riding days of night of the 1970s. Yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> you've been you've been really seeing China, uh, you know, develop from bicycle kingdom to an automobile kingdom, now the largest uh, automobile market in the world. <laughs> that was really. Yeah. You see that in the four decades. So, uh, uh, David, and uh, you also lived in China for, for, for many, many years, and uh, you've been actually 20 years involved with, uh, with China uh, uh, as well as, as a diplomat, but also now you, you are still working on this. So, so, so what's your impression on China and, uh, and uh, probably also what now you are, you are, you are uh, you know, uh, president of the Bush uh, uh, China Foundation now. So, so what, what is your, uh, 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 you know, memories and, and also how, how do you think the Bush uh, Foundation for both uh, uh, Neil and you to, to take this? I think if I were summarizing it in, in kind of one idea or one sentence, it would be uh, that uh, when I first visited China in the 1980s, I think the average citizen didn't feel that they had a lot of control uh, over their own destiny uh, with respect to these myriad really important decisions in their personal lives. Uh, but now, uh, and certainly I think since the 1990s and unquestionably today, the average uh, Chinese citizen I think feels that they have vastly more ability to shape their future 
than they did in the 1970s, 1980s, and so on. So it has been an incredible transformation. And of course, that's to say nothing of the physical transformation that's occurred uh, in China and that uh, you, Henry, and Neil were just discussing. And recently, US China Business Council have done a survey that uh, find this tariff actually cost US almost a quarter million jobs and, and many, many costs. Uh, uh, and, but still, China and US trade is still uh, China imported as much as uh, you know, increasing still, and also the trade has increased. Uh, so, so what what do you two, you know assess this uh, uh, current China U.S. Uh, relations and how we can really uh, improve that? How we can really uh, uh, maybe get a bit uh, normalcy there, rather than we are uh, we are we are we are now uh, in such kind of a, a, a deteriorated position. And and of course, also I've been talking with a number of U.S. opinion leaders like uh, Graham Allison, Joseph Nye, and. Uh, 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 of course, John Sonten just recently, and of course, uh, uh, Seng Tan Head and, uh, and Susan Sonten, uh, uh, and Ambassador Roy, I mean, <laughs> you know, many of them. They, they, they all say, you know, we shouldn't be have a, have a, 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 a cold war, we should not decouple, and, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they have all that kind of a consensus. Of course, how can we, both countries, work better towards a, a better relation, uh, giving your foundation's view, maybe your, your personal view as well. You know, I might take a take a high level stab at this and then let David dig dive deeper. Sure. Um, first of all, you 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 referenced the 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 deterioration in the in the relationship. Um, and it it strikes me that there are a number of converging factors that have led to the US side um, uh, becoming fearful of China's rise and and that fear is reflected in rhetoric that has become under the Trump administration quite harsh. Um, and, and, and with that became kind of a, an isolationist approach of stepping back and not having dialogue. My, my dad believed at his core that, you know, that countries and families and friends, you know, need to stay in touch with one another in order to better understand one another, in order to put yourself in the other guy's shoes so that when conflict arises, you can address those conflicts in a mature way. We got away from that for five years or so, and maybe even prior to that, David can give his analysis. Thanks, and Neil, thank you. And, and just to pick up on, on, on the really good points that Neil made about tariffs, I mean, Neil and I both, uh, even before we met each other uh, three years ago, were both, uh, you know, uh, very much uh, very critical of the US policy on tariffs and the Trump tariffs uh, on the same grounds that they're bad for America. They're bad for American companies. They're bad for American workers. They kill jobs, they blow out the deficit and they do nothing to solve any of the core problems that exist, that actually do exist between the United States and China in the trade area. And under President Trump, we had the highest US trade deficit with China in American history. Under President Trump, we had the highest average annual merchandise trade deficit with China of any presidency in the history. So to compare apples to apples, the entire presidency, uh, the average annual, uh, average annual def uh, deficit with China was higher under Trump than any other previous presidency. Uh, um, so those numbers speak for themselves. It wasn't just a one year wonder type of phenomenon. It was, it was four years. Um, the U.S. trade deficit with the world grew to record levels under President Trump. We lost manufacturing jobs, tens of thousands of them under President Trump. We lost jobs overall, 250,000, as Neil just cited, from the U.S.-China Business Council under these imbecilic policies. Uh, the historic U.S. trade surplus with China in agriculture became a trade deficit for the first time in 25 years, something that none of us thought was even possible. And of course, uh, American uh, consumers ended up paying more to the tune of about 1000 or even $2,000 a year, uh, more than they were uh, before the tariffs came into play. By every single metric that you could possibly uh, cite, uh, the tariffs were just exactly as Neil said, an absolutely failed policy that was horrible for America, is horrible for America, and we need to get rid of it. Uh, the, 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 the Trump tariffs were predicated on the idea that comparative advantage uh, doesn't exist. 
And uh, that is as unrepublican and un-American a thought as you could ever conceive. Uh, comparative advantage does exist. And we have to get back to the idea that the pie gets bigger when countries produce what they're best at producing. And even imperfect trade is better than no trade. So we've got to get back uh, to, to, to um, classical American thinking. Now we have a new consensus, unfortunately, uh, in uh, official Washington, and that is that China uh, is really the enemy of our nation. There's a vast swath of official Washington that seems to believe that. And there's a significant swath of the American public that has come to believe that. I think uh, Neil and I and the Bush China Foundation reject that, uh, that idea and that, that belief. Um, but I think that belief is rooted in two erroneous assessments of China's um, intentions. One, that China seeks to displace the United States and supplant the United States as the world's only superpower. And I think that is an absolutely fundamental misreading of what China actually wants to do. And number two, that China seeks to replicate its system all across the world and create a bunch of countries that look exactly like China uh, and basically to push forward uh, its system as, as uh, uh, you know, across the world so that there are you know, more systems that look like China's than there are today. I think those are incorrect understandings of what China actually seeks to do. And when the fundamental premises of US policy toward China are wrong, the resulting policies that's, that, that purport to address those uh, concerns are going to veer off course. And I think that's what we've seen over the last several years. So you know, we need to have a sharp focus on US interests and to uh, get the emotions out of our policy formulation and policy execution and focus as President George H.W. Bush did on the long-term interests of our nation. And I think if we do that, we can get this relationship back on course. This is actually a competitive advantage you talk about, you know, that uh, David Ricardo's uh, theory that, uh, you know, the country does the best that maybe we should exchange. And, and the U.S. has many areas, technology, <laughs> Uh, you know, U.S. financial uh, power and uh, uh, dominance in the, in, the, in, the, in the internet and many areas. So, so, so China has been doing well in the infrastructure and also uh, many other. I, I see a lot of collaboration there. Uh, but just unfortunately now we're, we're actually, you know, we're facing, the whole world is facing a, a huge challenge. We've been, uh, uh, you know, in this uh, pandemic, this COVID-19, uh, now <laughs> we're getting probably with COVID-2012 now. It's, it's really still, uh, you know, cutting us off, uh, at least uh, uh, for travel. So, so what do you think that we should really work together on, on this? Because I, I see this as the biggest opportunities. Like we, I was talking, talking to Susan uh, Santon, the former assistant deputy secretary of the US. She was saying, you know, look, I mean, the COVID-19 could be the best occasion uh, for the US and China to, to, to let bygone be bygone. Let's, let's concentrate on this common threat enemy number one to the humankind, rather than we have actually, uh, now because of COVID-19, we have actually divided even more so. Uh, I mean, you have this origin of tracing and the blaming of, on China, but also uh, there's, uh, we see, uh, uh, you know, uh, finger pointing uh, as well. And uh, how do you think that we can uh, fight this uh, uh, pandemic? And, it, and it's a question I would ask on, on a number of major topics that that affect the sustainability of life on earth for humans including climate change uh, food insecurity everything health related the pandemic is kind of the most obvious and and most pressing matter that you brought up in fact it's hard to imagine not solving these issues without the collaboration of china and the in the united states there's a there's a clear mandate and necessity for all of us to share our common humanity in addressing these these kinds of issues we we we, we don't have a national pride or national um, drive to combat this pandemic in a way that that we as a nation could but we should learn from one another you know we should be open-minded about looking at what new zealand has done and what australia has done what china has done what other countries have done we should share the best technologies that exist for vaccine development and have manufacturers all over the world convert their manufacturing to, vac to vaccine manufacturing of qualified 
vaccines so that uh, the, the global population could be more readily vaccinated against this pandemic and the spread of it through the various variants. Um, you know, the drugs that, are, that, that can be administered, all of these kinds of things need to be, there needs to be more of an of a environment of collaboration, which sadly doesn't exist today. And I, I'm, I'm not, I'm convinced that, that you know, that things are, will change over time. I'm, I may be the only guy out there that says this, but I do believe that this administration, you know, is already creating more opportunities for exchange and dialogue and that kind of thing. And inevitably, when you sit down and you have dialogue with, with counterparts, good things come out of it. Better understanding and 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 um, you know an addressing of serious issues, and the I, the topic of collaborating on the pandemic and and healthcare related issues in general should be should be front and center on on the table of, for discussion. I, I agree. I absolutely agree with you. I think that uh, uh, you know we need to improve our communication uh, dialogues and. Uh, I mean, the COVID-19 already uh, st uh, separated us. We, we can't have a face-to-face -face meetings. So we should really be careful of, of our languages and of our, 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 our you know, the, the discussion and in exchanges. I, I'm glad to see uh, President Biden, act, when he comes to the office, he actually signed an executive order banning the use of ethnic language refu refers to the to the virus. Uh, uh, so that is a good, good sign. So, so we hope that uh, uh, things can, can get better. I, I know that, uh, no, we, we can talk a bit more on that, but you know, President Biden is already uh, over six months in the office and uh, China and US, we had uh, quite a several rounds of uh, discussion. So, so we hope, you know, we can really now facing those huge issues, facing those, uh, uh, you know, the more uh, challenges that US and China can really, uh, you know, work together on those uh, uh, mostly critical issues to the mankind, uh, to the whole world. Uh, to the to the to the seven point five billion people because the number two number one and number two largest economy in the world have a moral responsibility to do that. So how can we really uh, improve on that? And uh, and uh, so so what do you think about uh, uh, where are the low hanging fruit? Can we start uh, uh, climate change so we can get some positive news? We can get some positive uh, uh, message across the countries. We can you know now that we have the student back. Can we have a U.S. student back to China? Or can we uh, have the consulate <laughs> resumed in both Houston and uh, where you, you, both of you are based in Texas and in China too? So things like that. Uh, 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 probably, uh, Neil, you, you can give some uh, uh, first. Uh, uh, we, we're a land of immigrants, and I know these students aren't immigrating, but we, I, I just think it's wonderful how America you know, has taken kind of the best of, of talent from all over the world. They come to this part of the world, they learn and go back to their countries or stay and help us build our economies. And there's so, so much value to those student, um, student experiences, both the U.S. students going to China and vice versa, come to Chinese students coming here. Neil, what you understand and what I understand, and I think what Henry understands, is that actually there's huge value and having students from all over the world come to this country and contribute to our research and development, contribute to uh, scholarship at universities, uh, contribute to uh, the development of new ideas and innovation, new companies. And um, the notion that by turning off that spigot and shutting that down, that that's good for America is just about as dumb an idea uh, in terms of uh, the modern uh, 21st century economy as I can imagine. And so to see it move back toward uh, a more normal level, at least in terms of Chinese students coming to the United States. And I certainly hope we'll see an analogous uh, upward tick in US students getting back to China once the overall health situation allows for that. Uh, these exchanges are great for our countries and we need to increase them, not decrease them. Uh, I, just as a, a side note relative to um, Henry's question, in terms of what's the low hanging fruit, in addition to getting student numbers back up, I think we need to get the Fulbright pro, uh, program back up and running again. We need to get other cultural and educational exchanges back up and running. Yes, of course, Henry, you're right. We need to get the two consulates back up and running again. Uh, Neil and I both feel very strongly about that and so many other Americans. We've got to, you know, we're, we're not helping anybody by shutting down the, the Chinese consulate general in Houston or the U.S. consulate general in Chengdu. It, it hinders both countries' abilities to provide services for citizens, to support business, 
in trade and so forth and so on. Regarding the investigation of origin of virus, uh, some argue that uh, uh, there's more politics into that rather than the scientists into that. And uh, so what do you thought on that, how we can get out of that? And how should China and US cooperate uh, on fighting against a, a pandemic? So basically they've been, they've been uh, you know, ling linger on those uh, questions that we, we, we touched upon briefly. Uh, perhaps you could give uh, 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 your uh, you know, uh, answer to that uh, uh, as you see your feet. And maybe, uh, maybe Neil, uh, and then we'll have uh, David. But, but of course, with the question okay. we just covered before. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start on the, uh, the last question you raised about the origins of the virus. Who cares where it or originated? Whether it originated you know, in a lab or from a bat or from the United States or from other, wherever it originated, who cares? The fact is we have a pandemic that continues to affect the lives of hundreds of thousands of people all across the globe. And there's, there's a pressing need for mature civilized nations in the world to work together. And so, so I, D David will have, may have more specific ideas on how we can work together, um, but it seems like collaboration is very natural when it comes to something as big as this and the origins of it. And I, and I, will, I will put a little you know, caveat that, you know, I reject the idea that there was some malicious effort to release a virus, a, a, pan, a virus that causes a pandemic. I think that's a crazy notion. There was some intent from one side or the other, you know, to do this, do this on purpose. So you throw away the crazy conspiracy theories um, and just assume that there was, there was, there was, you know, an origin of some kind. Doesn't matter where it originated. Let's deal with it together. Yeah, well, thanks, Henry. And uh, l let me just start by saying I completely agree with what Neil just said, that the, the idea that this was something that was unleashed upon the world with intentionality is ludicrous and, and, and just not a serious idea. Um, why would it, a country unleash something on itself and everyone else that it trades with and so forth? It just doesn't make any sense. Um, so yeah, again, there, there are areas, I think, within the context of uh, COVID-19 and pandemics more generally that we ought to work on together. Let me make one point at the outset, which is COVID-19 is not going to be the last pandemic that we as a world ever face. I mean, we know that. There will periodically be pandemics. They'll originate here, they'll originate there, uh, meaning very, you know, this country, country A, country B. Um, and we will have to cope as a global community with pandemics forever, uh, periodically. And so learning how to work together and to actually solve uh, medical and public health and, and uh, epidemi epidemiological problems is a good thing for our countries to be able to do. I think we were able to do that to a greater degree when the, when the relationship was less politically charged than it is at present and we've gotten away from it. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time.